Thank you. I uh, have to admit that I'm a little bit intimidated to speak in front of this audience. Um, this is uh, one of several talks that uh, I emphasize this, uh, the renormalization group approach to the easing model and um, in particular. And I hope and expect that my talk will be uh, complementary to the other talks. And uh, in fact, going to try to emphasize uh, aspects um, and um, uh, different from what we heard about yesterday. And in fact, I'll also try to hint at some connections to the approaches that are typically used to avoid the renormalization group approach. Um, and um, maybe, um, so the renormalization group approach is not nearly as old as the Ising model, but I, I think it's also about at least 50 years old, but you know, longer if you like. And there is, uh, if there's one name to, to mention, um, might be the one of Wilson. And I thought it might be a good way to start this talk with this, uh, what I thought was an appropriate uh, quote uh, that I took from his uh, 82 uh, Nobel lecture. Um, quote is like this. Uh, when I entered grad school, I carried out the instructions given to me by my father and had knocked on both uh, Murray Gelman's and Feynman's doors and asked them what they were currently doing. Murray wrote down the partition function for the three-dimensional easing model and said it would be nice if I could solve it. And uh, Feynman's answer was he was doing nothing. Uh, <laughs> Any, anyway, I remember a, a version of this story with uh, Joel Leibovitz uh, when he was, I think, postdoc with Onsaga, but I, was, I just confirmed yesterday the story wasn't exactly the same. It was uh, Onsaga was trying to do it himself, I, I guess. <laughs> anyway, um, um, uh, Rick Kenyon pointed out yesterday that we haven't seen the definition of the easing model, so uh, here it is. Uh, um, so maybe emphasizing uh, the conventions that I want to make, which um, <coughs> Uh, maybe a slightly less standard, um, well, uh, as much as it can be less standard. So uh, the coupling matrix A includes the temperature, and I'm putting a minus sign in front of it. So the ferromagnetic case, which is the main case I have an interest, corresponds to uh, negative off-diagonal entries. But I want to assume that uh, this matrix A is positive definite, and you can always do that by adding a diagonal. Uh, to the matrix, and it doesn't change the easing model, of course, because the spins have length one. So this is one convention I want to make. So instead of M parameterizing by temperature, I would write this matrix A. And um, so the standard nearest ma neighbor model would correspond to A being given by the minus <coughs> the nearest neighbor lattice Laplacian times the inverse temperature parameter beta. Um, now, the renormalization group, as I mentioned, predates Wilson. And uh, the best picture, I, I, I think, to uh, say in one slide, um, what it's trying to achieve is uh, this one of uh, the Carter of block spin picture. Uh, we start with an easing system, say, two dimensions for the purpose of the picture. Uh, we'd like to re-block the spins into blocks and hope that uh, after we do this, uh, where well, the blocks behave as if it was an easing model. And, um, uh, this quote also summarizes, uh, I think, nicely um, uh, how to think about it. In short, the Cardanoff block picture, also absorbed, will be the basis for generalizations which are not absorbed. Um, and um, so back to the definition of the Ising model. Um, throughout the talk, um, it will be helpful, and I'll also be talking about a close uh, relative of the Ising model, which um, is not only um, maybe for what, what I think for many physical purposes uh, just as good, but it also provides a slightly different way to think about the model and uh, has been helpful historically, um, um, uh, which is the Phi 4 model, a lattice Phi 4 model. Uh, it's defined like an easing model with the only difference that spins don't take values plus minus one, but they're continuous. And rather than being forced to take the values plus minus one, they are confined by double well, well potential. So this constant nu is negative. Um, um, and um, so for, I would say, uh, all physical purposes, the Ising model and the Phi 4 model are equivalent uh, in the sense, uh, not, not only for physical purposes, also uh, in a mathematical sense, if you like. Uh, you can obtain the Ising model from the Phi 4 model by just taking this uh, interaction strength g to infinity if you take nu suitable to minus infinity, so that the double well concentrates on two points. 
Uh, conversely, you can also obtain the Phi 4 model from the Ising model by what's uh, uh, known as the Griffith Simon construction. You replace the, uh, every vertex of the graph by a complete graph tuned to be at the, uh, with mean field interaction tuned to be at the critical temperature. And then um, um, you obtain the Phi 4 model. So this, this picture taken from uh, Michael Eisenman's uh, a uh, beautiful paper uh, summarizes uh, this construction nicely. And since we haven't seen it, um, uh, let me use this as an opportunity to uh, mention uh, this relation as well. Um, so why do we uh, discuss the Ising and the Phi 4 model if both of them are more or less equivalent? Um, um, well, both models have a slightly different uh, way of thinking associated with them and also um, different technical advantages if, uh, that, that one can use. Uh, the Phi 4 model, if I go back, uh, it has a natural small parameter or a natural parameter G, which you can take small. Um, and um, that can be helpful. And the Ising model, if we start with the nearest neighbor case, it doesn't have such a parameter. Um, if you're, so mu much of what I'm talking about is uh, thinking about the critical or near critical case. So in that case, there's no small parameter. Otherwise, of course, you can look at the temperature as a small or large parameter, but near the critical temperature is no small parameter. Um, you could introduce a small parameter in the Ising model in various other ways. For example, by replacing the nearest neighbor interaction by a finite range interaction, which uh, way the range of the, uh, the range can serve as a large parameter, which uh, is pretty much, uh, is very closely related to this, uh, 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 which one can think of roughly as 1 over g. So, um, I, and I'll, I'll get back to this, uh, this point. Now, uh, so we've learned that uh, the block picture is uh, absorbed in some way, but um, uh, there's a generalization which is not, and um, I think uh, to summarize where this is starting from, is uh, the best is, uh, is this very basic identity that um, um, uh, that I guess everyone uh, uh, knows in some way. Um, we have a Gaussian density, some positive definite matrix A in there. Uh, that's why I chose A positive definite. Uh, you can write it as a convolution of two Gaussian densities. Um, and uh, provided that A inverse is the sum of, of the two matri of the inverses of the two matrices here. Um, and this is uh, nothing but the probabilistic fact that if you have two independent normal Gaussian ra random variables that their sum is again Gaussian and that what adds is the covariance and not the <laughs> incidence matrices. So that's this identity. And um, so surely this identity, well, we've, uh, we've seen it in some form in, I don't know if it was Alessandro or Raphael's talk uh, yesterday, uh, a version of this uh, for uh, Grassmann variables uh, was, was mentioned yesterday. But uh, anyway, this is um, sort of, I think, where, where this approach starts. It may, may not be emphasized in this strict way in, say, the, the original papers, but surely it, uh, it, it underlies implicitly what, what's done there. And, Maybe let me use this as an opportunity to, to mention uh, one paper where I think, well, as far as I'm aware, and I'm also aware that there are people in the audience who, are, who, who know the history of these things much better than I do, but um, uh, there's this paper from 87, from what I guess uh, I call the initiators of the Italian school of the renormalization group, uh, who uh, basically emphasize these uh, probabilistic um, uh, aspects. Um, so this identity appears explicitly in the partition function of the Ising model. Uh, so uh, we may insert it uh, in there. And uh, what it leads to is an additional variable, phi, um, which um, we may think of as a block spin field. At this point, this it has nothing to do with a block spin field. This is completely general. But um, um, I still refer to it as a block spin field. So we start with the definition of the Ising model, it put the magnetic field to be 0, and we can insert this identity. And, uh, where we get a different formula for the partition function of the Ising model, which has the additional uh, phi variable that we're integrating over. Um, and um, so from this point, um, you can proceed uh, in a way that uh, Alessandro and Raphael uh, uh, sort of outlined uh, in the fermionic context yesterday. You could iterate this identity and uh, 
try to uh, you know, carry out th this sum, uh, then everything will only depend on phi and you keep going um, iteratively um, with suitable chosen matrices here. Uh, let me not do this uh, right now, but um, maybe emphasize a different way to think about this, uh, which um, I, I guess I in particular learned with uh, Thierry Boudinot, who's here. Um, um, uh, but I think it's a good way to think about this uh, maybe more probabilistically uh, by, so these two factors here are not, not <coughs> this, this factor here is an easing model, but it's not normalized, so let's normalize it. So I'm putting in a normalization factor, which I write like this, e to the plus v a prime of phi, and I divide by it again. So then this is a normalized easing expectation, except that the coupling matrix A was replaced by a prime and, uh, and uh, couples to an external field phi as well. Um, so, this is, so now we have an additional uh, new easing model, but this new easing model has a different uh, coupling matrix, uh, or if you want like to think a different temperature. Uh, and, but then it's coupled to this external field, uh, which I call the block spin field. And the block spin field is a continuous field, um, uh, and it has, given, it has this distribution. And this uh, VA is, uh, uh, typically called the renormalized potential. In the case of the easing model, just defined like this. You take the minus the log of the sum of our easing configurations uh, with the coupling matrix A prime and uh, the field in there like that. Um, just as a historical remark, in physics this passage from sigmas to phi is called, usually called Hubbard's extrapolation. Yes, uh, the, this is more or less the same indeed. Okay. But anyway, um, Question? Yes. The, the, you, you call this a block spin field, but, uh, but you do, the phi do reside on the same lattice? Or? They do reside on the same lattice, uh, not a block spin field. Um, they're anything at this point. I, I haven't told you what this decomposition A inverse into these two are. Uh, you can make a certain uh, choice that resembles a block spin field. Uh, this was done um, by Gavetsky and Kupiainen in this context. You can make a choice where this uh, A double prime is not exactly living on the blocks. Uh, if you, you can't uh, uh, get a good decomposition by doing this uh, with an independent um, uh, A prime matrix here, but it's determined by a field that lives on the block and then is sort of smoothly extended to uh, um, outside the blocks. So this was done by Gavetsky and Kupiain and corresponds to one particular choice. Of this, uh, in this, this case, this becomes sort of a, a block spin field, but it, uh, um, it's, you, you can arrange it in such a way that it's determined by a block spin field. Um, but, uh, so as opposed to Kardonov's picture, this, this is exact. Um, um, if you, you can uh, try to write down uh, the block spin potential in Kardonov's picture and you see you'll get a huge mess, or at least uh, that's what people uh, seem to get. Uh, uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so, um, so once you do this, um, um, so the matrices A and A prime, they were general, but when, when it, basically the renormalization group approach is uh, um, one way to think about it is to make these matrices A depend on a parameter. And I'm going to call this parameter T for, for the time being, and uh, it's called scale. Um, uh, of course, this again anticipates a particular choice of these matrices to be made. But then once you do this, you, you divide, you basically what we've done, we've divided the easing measure into um, well, a new easing measure with a um, sort of renormalized uh, coupling matrix uh, and uh, coupled to a block spin field and an expectation of a block spin field. Um, uh, that, that's the way, um, 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 well, that, that's what the identity says. And um, so, and the usual approach is now to um, well, if we're interested, for example, in long distance behavior, scaling limits, and so on, those should be contained, or essentially be determined by, by what happens at the block spin field. And so um, the renormalization group perspective is sort of to study this uh, red measure here uh, as much as you can. Um, but I, maybe I want to emphasize an, uh, a, a basic fact that is, uh, I think, obvious to all the practitioners. Uh, of, of this method, but maybe not always emphasized in the same way, um, uh, which is that the left-hand side does not depend on this scale parameter T I introduced here. 
So, uh, but on the, the two terms on the right hand side, the blue and the red, do. <coughs> and um, if we're interested in how, uh, say, this renormalized measure varies with t, well, that is equivalent to asking how this renormalized easing measure varies to t, with t. The, the, they the, the effects compensate, uh, so net effect is zero. So uh, one just moves in the other direction than, than the other. And so these two perspectives um, are, in fact, equivalent. And you can make this more explicit if you want. You can look at, for example, uh, the endpoint correlation functions of this renormalized easing model. They are the same as the um, uh, nth derivative of the renormalized potential, which determines this, uh, this block spin field. Um, so, um, so this leads to, I think, two perspectives which are usually presented as sort of alternative ways to think about the problem. But one, one thing I want to argue is that these are more or less uh, um, conceptually the same way to think about the problem, though technically uh, the, the methods will be very different. So the one is, and that, that's going to be the focus of my talk, is uh, what I call the renormalization group perspective, which is to understand how this uh, block spin uh, measure depends on the scale parameter, how it, um, um, how it behaves as the scale parameter uh, varies and becomes large, uh, which somehow should encode the uh, <coughs> scaling limit information. And so here is a... Um, picture, we started with a 5-4 like model and you keep doing this, what you might expect is that, well, um, say if you're a little bit above the critical temperature that the potential evolves in some way like this. Now, of course, these pictures here have made a, a, a huge simplification. This is a one-dimensional picture for an infinite dimensional uh, function. Uh, uh, and somehow that's, that's much of the problem of uh, um, uh, uh, ma making, uh, well, uh, much of the difficulty in, in this approach. But you could also look at the dual perspective, um, which is to ask how does this measure vary? As I, as I explained, this is, is essentially equivalent. Um, uh, at least if this, this dual, this fluctuation measure couples to this external field. So this, uh, from this perspective, is, is, is is, uh, is not convenient or makes it hard, but uh, you might imagine that for many purposes this external field is actually um, may not matter that much, so maybe you just replace that by zero. And then you just check how an easing model varies with, say, a temperature parameter. And so if you add the external field, these are equivalent, uh, but if you don't, uh, they're, they're not exactly, but still uh, I think the way of thinking about this is uh, um, is analogous. Um, so, um, so, so these two perspectives are usually presented uh, not together, but uh, um, let me focus on the renormalization group perspective uh, first. Um, this has turned out, and sort of if you open Wilson, Kogut, and like uh, the uh, all the uh, literature on that. Uh, this is sort of the perspective you'll see. Um, and um, uh, basically um, it's about trying to derive a very precise uh, understanding of what this renormalized measure <laughs> looks like. You start with something that looks like phi 4 and then as you vary the scale parameter it may look the shape of the double well would change and, and so on. And um, um, the goal of, is, is to understand how, how to quantify this. And this is usually based on expand, delicate uh, multi-scale expansion methods. Um, they have a lot of good things speaking for them, which uh, is that, um, for example, correlation inequalities are not needed in this approach. Um, you, it doesn't really matter whether you're looking at an Ising model or a Heisenberg model. Um, 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 and uh, more general uh, um, uh, models, um, but they, they come at the, uh, at, at the cost that if you're not in this regime of having a small parameter, then um, um, it's hard, well, it's, it's, it's becomes a very hard problem. Um, um, so this dual perspective, um, 
which in principle is equivalent, uh, it really only becomes useful when you make a special choice of this decomposition, which uh, preserves that the, the, the easing model you're looking at is ferromagnetic. In general, uh, I explained you decompose this, uh, this coupling matrix or the inverses of it, and the way one likes to do that in the expansion approach, ferromagnetic, uh, it doesn't play a role that the couplings are ferromagnetic. And uh, so um, the place, uh, it's not important. So uh, the typical, the best ways to decompose um, uh, this measure uh, do not preserve uh, ferromag uh, the ferromagnetic structure of the, of, of, of the model. And um, if you want to use the dual approach, well then, well, they somehow preserve enough of it that it's still ferromagnetic. Effectively, but not strictly. Yeah, I mean they, they preserve enough of it that maybe effectively it's it's ferromagnetic, but it's not something uh, not enough that you can go ahead and use correlation inequalities, things like that. That um, uh, you, you're basically once you resort uh, to breaking the ferromagnetic structure, then uh, uh, you're you're locked into uh, methods like that. So the. Is there another question? Yeah. Yes, so Michael. Should we think of the left hand, what you call the left hand side, as fixed uh, measure, say, at the critical point? Yeah, so think about it as an easing model at a, at a fixed temperature, let's say the critical point. Yeah. 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 So if, if this is a critical point, this is typically going to be an easing model at a higher temperature. Um, so this uh, dual perspective is, uh, becomes very useful when you make a specific choice, as I mentioned, that preserves the ferromagnetic structure. Um, now, in this case, you can... Um, uh, um, uh, this is... Um, uh, so this is usually not called the dual perspective, but maybe the approach through differential inequalities and things like that. So you can... Uh, so what it turns out, uh, you have in this case you have a very uh, strong non-perturbative tools such as correlation inequality, bounds resulting from reflection positivity, uh, and random walk and current representation that allow you to get information about this measure. Uh, and uh, often uh, these methods uh, allow you to derive uh, differential inequalities and uh, things like that, which uh, in some sense um, are a way to um, uh, capture uh, the evolution of the renormalized potential uh, uh, from, 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 from this other perspective. It has sort of the same information in it, um, 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 but uh, is based on a completely different set of tools. And um, so. Um, differential in what? So, for example, you, uh, you look at, a, say, uh, susceptibility uh, and you differentiate with respect to T and then you get, uh, uh, you get identities and, uh, as it turns out, in this case, you can uh, often uh, close them in terms of other correlation functions. So, it gives you sort of this way of thinking of it. It gives you relations between different derivatives of, of the renormalized potential, which are the correlation functions, which are related in certain ways. Um, So here, here I'm just flashing. I, as I'm not going to be trying, I'm not trying to be accurate with the um, uh, with the uh, uh, all the references. Uh, I, I want to sort of try to get the main messages across. But uh, let me just highlight some uh, highlights uh, uh, <laughs> in this business uh, uh, on 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 the renormalization group perspective. Uh, is the construction of uh, critical phi four models uh, with weak coupling constant four dimensions by uh, Gavetsky, Kupiainen, and uh, Feldman, Manja, Rivaso, and Senior, um, essentially. Um, and uh, uh, later on, um, uh, alternative approaches were also developed, in particular by David Bridges with various others. And um, uh, from the dual perspective, um, uh, the names uh, to mention are. Many of them are here. Uh, there's uh, Michael Eisenman, the uh, triviality of the Phi 4 models, uh, Burgess, Furlich, Spencer, and Sokol. Uh, two of them are at least here. Um, um, this approach, I, I would say, uh, the lace expansion approach to, to these easing and Phi 4 models would correspond to sort of the perspective on this. You try to get um, relations on how um, uh, correlation functions vary if you vary a mass. 
uh, or a temperature. And, uh, and then uh, last but uh, by no means least, there's the recent breakthrough of uh, Eisenman and Hugo on the triviality of five form and easing models in four dimensions, which uh, sort of uh, approach the problems from this perspective. Um, so here are some pictures. Um, um, okay, so, so I think, so there, there's, um, so in some sense, um, one point I want to make is that um, sort of all ways of thinking about the easing model in four and higher dimensions are in some sense coming, um, uh, in some sense the idea of varying a scale parameter does play a role in, in, in all of these and uh, more and uh, more, uh, it's more or less important. Um, and um, the, the big picture, and others in this audience can explain this much better than I do, but let me at least um, try to say in one slide what the dream uh, <laughs> of, of the renormalization group method is. Uh, uh, um, so first, um, there's a critical dimension, which is four. Um, uh, above four dimensions, uh, scaling limits are Gaussian free fields, uh, multiples of that Gaussian free fields. Um, at four dimensions, their scaling limits are also um, multiples of free fields, but there are um, logarithmic corrections to various thermodynamic and uh, 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 quantities and composite uh, fields uh, with universal exponents. So it would be the same for phi 4 easing model and much more generally. And of course, in less than four dimensions, we expect universal non-Gaussian large distance behavior. And um, I guess in, in, this, uh, in this formulation, uh, this is much, um, in this strength, <laughs> we know a lot about this, uh, what is happening here, but in this strength, much of this is open, of course, um, mathematically. Um, the renormalization group picture, uh, uh, picture provides a, what I think is a beautiful picture of why this should happen. Um, and it explains universality in, in the way that uh, basically all this behavior should be uh, determined by, uh, by fixed points of the renormalization group map. So these are somehow uh, these renormalized potentials which are stationary once you add some rescaling into them. They, they don't change asymptotically. Um, so these fixed points should determine uh, the behavior of, of the model. And um, four dimensions plays a, uh, plays a conceptually uh, central role in the sense that um, we expect and be below four dimensions to, there are to be uh, two, um, well, let's say between two and four dimensions, there are to be two uh, fixed points, the free field and what is called the, uh, I guess, the Ising fixed point or Wilson-Fisher fixed point, um, which uh, sort of, um, if you allow yourself to vary the dimension continuously, uh, uh, these, these two fixed points come together and they, they merge at four dimensions. So this is uh, sort of the beautiful uh, mathematically largely conje or conjectural picture of what's supposed to happen. And, um, um, and what I will uh, try to explain is some of the things that we do sort of uh, understand. Um, and uh, somehow the, um, the, I think the, uh, uh, the best, uh, well, somehow the, the starting point uh, for all of this is in, in some sense of uh, four dimensions plays the central role in the sense that uh, that's, uh, that's where um, uh, the transition between the non-Gaussian and Gaussian behavior happens. And, um, uh, not, not only because it's in the middle of uh, d bigger than 4 and d less than 4, but also historically I think the four-dimensional case is, uh, is, as I'll hint at, um, um, it's been important. Um, so um, there's, from the physics perspective, uh, basically I, I would say it's fair to say, uh, people in the audience who, who've actually done these things uh, there will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, is, I would say this, this case is uh, settled. Um, we, we know everything. Um, so, and uh, in fact, if you're willing to take a phi 4 model with a weak coupling constant, much of this is, uh, is a theorem by now. So, I mean, here's, uh, I'm just flashing uh, 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 a theorem that collects uh, uh, work from 
many different uh, people and, and sort of one slide to give you an impression of uh, ba basically that all the kind of things that, that are understood uh, on the level of physics are, are, are essentially theorems. So for example, if you look at the two-point function at the critical point, it behaves like a free field two-point function. Look at the susceptibility, it behaves like a free field susceptibility, except that there is a, um, a logarithmic correction with a universal exponent. This, similarly for the specific heat, so the, this n is the number of components. So all of these things also hold for, for Heisenberg models and, and so on. Or, and um, there are uh, scaling limits are, are free fields. Uh, if you look at sort of energy-like correlations, so say the square of the field, uh, they, they, they are not free field, but they have log, correct, uh, log corrections. Uh, uh, magnetization doesn't behave like h to the one-third, which would be the free field exponent, but again, there's a log correction, etc. So um, basically, if you're willing to settle for a weakly coupled phi-4 model, um, I'd say it's fair to say that the full picture is, is there. Um, um, so, um, so much of the predictive behavior holds, um, but um, in fact, uh, this is all for phi-4 models. Once you go to an easing model, uh, act, strictly speaking, I guess none of these uh, things have been proved. Um, so, um, Unless you make it long-range easing. So yeah, well this is... Uh, same thing. So this is uh, so here is this is an open problem, but one that I'm quite confident is a doable problem. But uh, if you have a, l a little bit of time, <laughs> so you could instead of uh, looking at a phi four model, you could look at a weakly coupled easing model by looking at a finite range interaction. And then I do not expect there would be significant technical problems to make these theorems also theorems for the easing model if you make the range large enough. But no one has sat down and actually done it. But I, I don't think this is. Um, 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 L long range like uh, cuts uh, potential? No, finite range uh, are bigger than large constant. Well, cut potential you can certainly do, right? Yeah, yeah but, but the fi finite range. Yeah, okay. I, I don't think so. Anyway, no one has done it, and but I, I think this isn't, would not be a... Finite range means weakly coupled. If the range you if the range is large enough, you can use the range as a um, as a reciprocal coupling constant. Yeah. Um, so th there are other cases where these things have been uh, where, where where this sort of program has been carried out for other models, uh, and I don't expect there would be an issue here. But of course, it's these things are technical and they're always unforeseen <laughs> technical issues. But um, um, on, on the other hand, but uh, this will not get you anywhere uh, near the, I mean, the, the bounds on the range that you need uh, will be astronomical, <laughs> at least if you, if you, uh, if you do this. Um, so this will not get you to the nearest neighbor model. And um, so I, what I think, I mean, on the other hand, for the nearest neighbor model, uh, we do know uh, that any possible scaling limit you can get is a Gaussian field. Uh, the so-called uh, so renormalized coupling constant, which I strictly haven't defined, goes to zero. Um, and so um, um, we know all uh, possible limits are, are, are Gaussian. We don't know their free fields. Uh, maybe four dimension high enough, uh, this is known, but and uh, four dimensions, uh, it's not. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, there are bounds that. Uh, um, um, sort of capture some of the deviations from mean field behavior maybe at low, most logarithmic for various quantities, but they're not tight. So I think there, a natural open question is, uh, maybe from a physical perspective at this point, you, you, you can say this is, uh, this is good enough. Uh, and uh, um, <laughs> there's pretty good evidence that for all, um, for all of these models, uh, we obtain the same behavior. But uh, mathematically, of course, it asks for uh, the problem. Can you, can you do anything? Uh, can you get the, uh, the log corrections for a 40 nearest neighbor easing? Um, and it, it may be a, a somewhat, uh, you may, may um, um, I, I have no idea uh, how, but you may dream and may ask, can you sort of maybe combine these methods? Can you use this sort of as an input to get the RG started? It doesn't look easy because uh, these methods are very complex and it's 
it's not um, um, uh, you can ask and this is for Slava can you sort of these these uh, expansion methods they give very good bounds but sort of if you try to open them up and discretize them make a finite dimensional problem that you can sort of initialize on the computer it um, seems very hard to do this kind of thing uh, so these are maybe problems that um, um, but can I ask a question about yeah. the so you showed us there's this Hubbard Stratonovich transformation yeah. which maps using model on phi to the fourth yeah couldn't you ju just check that for some particular easing models, you just land after this transformation within weakly coupled phi to the fourth? Where you yeah, I mean, that, that's what happens. Uh, <laughs> but um, somehow the issue is um, you, you know that, say, the four point function is uh, close to zero, maybe the six point function, the eight point function, all the Newman bounds and so on, you, you get maybe uh, all of those. But it's not enough to. In the current form, the expansion methods that say derive all the logarithmic corrections to get that uh, started, right? You, you need more. Um, <laughs> and so this is well, maybe. I guess you're some of the higher point you're... functions non trivial? Um, well. Any below six dimensions, some of them become non trivial? Um, not, a, not that, I mean, so you're looking at like a composite field where like phi squared at x and phi squared at y or. No, but that's not what I meant. I mean, after the Hubbard Stratonovich, you just get an effective action for the phi field. You you know it. You yes. Have some norms in your theorem. Yeah, you but unfortunately, small... unfortunately, this information is not enough to control those norms. <laughs> and which information? I was say say. Hubbard right. You do the Hubbard Stratonovich. You get a and if you take t large enough, you know that the coupling constant front of the fourth order term is small. You also know that in some way the coupling constant in front of the six phi to the six term is small, etc. But these are sort of, I mean, this GT is sort of an averaged uh, version of, uh, I mean, it's one parameter uh, that covers sort of an infinite dimensional potential. You need you need more to get uh, um, in the domain of uh, of yeah. these methods. Uh, so anyway, um, I think this is a very interesting, presumably very hard uh, pro problem, but um, uh, maybe more modestly, you could ask even five dimensional, and this, uh, so this, uh, it's not known that uh, the scaling limit is actually a free field. We know it's Gaussian, but we don't know the two-point function is a free field. Uh, uh, in fact, maybe a somewhat interesting analogy is for, for self-avoiding walk, the analog is known. Um, but um, as interesting as this is, in some sense, I, I guess in some kind of a coincidence, the lace expansion happens to converge, and uh, there's no reason why it should. And yeah, is this true for the self-avoiding or only for the weakly self? -avoiding? Strictly self-avoiding walk, nearest neighbor, in five dimensions, the lace expansion does converge, um, but. Um, it's a lot I, of numerical input. Though. Yeah, there's numerical input, so it's the kind of thing that uh, Slava would would like, um, uh, I think. But I think this is more than, uh, say, uh, you would ask um, to get into the domain of the renormalization group map in the sense that here, really, the full expansion just converges. And uh, th there's no reason to assume that the radius of convergence is uh, related to phi. If it just happens so to be the case. Uh, but uh, it's not clear that at all that if you did the an, an analog, say, for the lace expansion of the Ising model, you could do, that you'd also get to five, and I would expect probably not. Um, there's no reason that this sort of strategy is, is going to work. At the Anyway, there's some uh, nice, but presumably hard non-perturbative problems here. Um, uh, I guess uh, even harder problems <laughs> if you try to go below four dimensions. Um, now, of course, part of the enormous success of the renormalization group picture is that it does provide us with a way to think about what should happen below four dimensions. Um, uh, should be a non-Gaussian um, non fixed point, uh, found in perturbation theory by Wilson and Michael Fisher uh, um, in, I, I don't know, a long time ago. Um, uh, there are uh, rigorous examples of such non-Gaussian fixed points and certain models where, well, you don't vary the spatial dimension, but you uh, look at, say, a long-range coupling, uh, which you can, where you can vary the exponent that effectively uh, plays the role of a dimension, and you can construct non-Gaussian fixed points. And um, um, it's an 
an active topic, but um, it's not clear uh, and it seems, well, it seems hopeless that by these kind of methods you're going to get to epsilon equals one. And so again, uh, well, anyway, let me not say more about this because uh, <laughs> I'm not calling these holy grails open problems, but anyway, I, maybe I can mention them anyway. Um, um, maybe, okay, so um, in the remaining uh, time... Sorry, what do you yeah. mean by the second uh, holy gra grail? Well, I mean, you could imagine, so another, so the first one is, uh, well, I guess, uh, Slava's dream, which is that you uh, de devise a renormalization group method, which you can discretize or uh, f uh, approximate and finite dimensions sufficiently well that you can get started with uh, computer-assisted input. Uh, the other one is, you may imagine that maybe you could show uh, the universality of uh, exponents without actually knowing them. So, sort of, uh, in much simpler context, these kind of, say, random matrix theory, that's the kind of thing that uh, people do, right? You compare uh, the model for which you know the exponent with the model where you don't, and uh, by taking a difference, you gain, uh, make, a, you get a dimensional gain um, uh, in doing this. So you, you might imagine that without actually knowing um, um, the exponents, you can somehow compare them. It's, it's not... Uh, uh, it's not going to be an easy problem, but uh, you can dream. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, Is it, so in, the, in the example you just mentioned, you know the exponents of the of the other matrix models, or, or no? Uh, you do know, but they actually don't play a role in the proofs. But those models are sort of mean field models. Uh, it's much easier to do these things uh, in that context. Uh, Is there then you can prove any of the same exponents without, without using the fact that you knew them before. Yeah. But, but it's sort of, yeah. Up yeah, to the example of that, right? I mean, with, uh, on either radio graphs, for instance, you can prove that the critical exponents of different systems are the oh. same. And we don't so know which, which example? Using, I mean, on either radio graphs, if you take uh, FK percolation, for instance, you can prove that you get the same critical exponents. But I mean, that's what uh, Nano and uh, Jeffrey did for percolation, but we don't know how to compute the critical exponents. So you, you have techniques sometimes. Uh -huh. Yeah, so anyway... Um, but there are infinitely many exponents, it's going to be hard to prove that they are all the same, all universal, unless you prove that the fixed point... Uh, I mean, I'm just backing up... Uh, yeah. Well, thank, thank you for <laughs> support. <laughs> I was a little shy putting these holy grails as, uh, well, as open problems. But anyway, uh, good to have in mind, maybe, to uh, <laughs> uh, what we'd love to understand. Um, um, maybe for the remaining time, um, I'll get back to um, uh, some more uh, mundane uh, uh, um, aspects um, uh, where... Um, 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 just say for the purpose of the discussion, we may think of say a four-dimensional easing of phi four model. Um, uh, so as I explained, this renormalized potential uh, could be defined in this way, um, uh, or you could start with a phi four model. Doesn't really matter. Um, so naively, this whole approach is based on, um, let's say, if you open Wilson's lectures. Uh, you imagine that uh, the effective potential can be expanded in some kind of uh, power series in terms of uh, powers of the field, which have sort of different scaling dimensions associated to them and so on. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, when you actually try uh, uh, to do this, uh, well, th there are some issues. Um, first of all, um, it's, uh, it's, not easy, it's not hard to convince yourself that this series will not be convergent. It's, uh, it's impossible to get a convergent series of phi. The, the signs of these, uh, of these terms do matter a lot for the stability of the problem and so on. And this is what um, is um, uh, sort of collectively known as the large field problem in, in the field. And um, so what, what do you do? Um, well, you, um, so the, Current solutions are sort of of the type that you don't try to take this picture too literally when this field phi is, is, is large. So typical proxies for the renormalized potential would be expansions for ex exponential of, of, of this type. 
um, sort of polymer expansions. Um, and uh, when the field, so you have control on, on these objects appearing there. Um, when the field is zero, the control is good enough, you can take the exponential of the whole right hand side and again write it as some kind of series. Uh, uh, for VT. Uh, I guess I'm, I mean, if you're in, even in high dimensions, if you want to get slightly below the transition, so you want to get spontaneous magnetization and so on. Yeah, that, that's, of course, that's actually something I haven't discussed at all. In fact, that's not a uh, regime that hasn't been, has been developed very well. Yeah, that's actually, that's actually very interesting, especially, of course, once you get to the models with continuous symmetry, but of course that, that opens a, uh, anyway, let me not go, get into that. Um, uh, so so this, the kind of control that you have is um, sort of of the type that maybe if you uh, have a small field of phi zero, you can get the sort of kind of expansion you want, and that's good for correlation functions, which are essentially derivatives at phi equals zero, but uh, they provide poor control when um, phi is large. And moreover, sort of a lot of the technical uh, difficulties of the subject um, um, are related to the fact that um, um, well the, these, these large fields are a pain to control. Let's put it that way. And um, new ways to do this would be very much uh, uh, helpful. Uh, not just for these problems to get simpler arguments, but also to get arguments that maybe uh, are more manageable for other problems. And uh, again, um, so there's, um, there's, so there, there's also some um, direct reasons uh, uh, we'd be interested in getting better control along away from sort of these, these typical configurations. Um, so large phi means somehow probabilistically unlikely uh, uh, configurations. Um, which for the equilibrium behavior don't, don't matter, but if you're interested in, for example, stochastic dynamics, they, they do matter. If you have unlikely configurations, the uh, dynamics can get trapped in a very unlikely configuration for a long time, things like that. So, so this kind of control is, is not, uh, not good uh, uh, if, you, if you're interested in also understanding the dynamical picture. Even with the static, so you're saying the prospects for Proving that beta is equal to a half in more than four dimensions, that's still... So beta is the low temperature... Spontaneous magnetization. Yeah, I mean, so below four dimension, I guess, uh, I don't know, Michael, you uh, know better what has been done on the correlation inequality side, but that's where it would have been done, or we go, I don't know. Uh, so the critical exponents uh, were proven yeah. uh, mean field above uh, the critical okay, dimension yeah. with logarithmic correct, type of correction in four, but you're talking about below. And I, I didn't let my teacher say about this. So, any, anyway, so this is uh, so this is a more technical um, uh, problem, but I think it's um, so these 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 large fields are much uh, at much of the source of the technical complication of the methods, and it would also be desirable to have uh, better methods to uh, to handle this uh, than the kind of things that are done now, which are effective to control the equi the static behavior, but uh, um, and you may, um, and so there was a recent, uh, uh, so, so we've been interested in this kind of information because we wanted to learn something about dynamics, and uh, there was a recent uh, correlation inequality that was proved by uh, uh, Jian Ding, um, Jiang Song, and Rongfen Sun, which in fact gives us a case where we see, um, so so this is basically, I've translated what they proved, uh, relies on the specific uh, uh, regularization so that you can uh, use correlation inequalities, so it remains the easing model. In this case, you can get global bounds on the renormalized potential using this correlation inequality, something we could not imagine to do by an expansion. We tried, <laughs> but it's, it's hard. Um, uh, so in this case, so basically it says, it looks like this. Uh, the worst case is at phi equals zero, roughly, um, uh, if you're looking at the Hessian. Uh, but it's, um, uh, it's the type of behavior we'd, we'd like to get a better handle on uh, directly rather than using resorting to correlation inequalities. Um, so this is sort of gives some control on the unlikely 
events. And one application of this, uh, so just to end with uh, uh, some um, recent work as well, that um, uh, we can uh, use this to, uh, uh, as, uh, as a fairly simple application to get some information about the uh, global dynamics of the easing model. So um, I'm not going to explain, introduce what it is. I guess we'll hear much more and maybe Fabio's talk tomorrow. Let me just say that, uh, well, you do the natural uh, uh, stochastic uh, dynamics. You could ask how long does it take to reach equilibrium. Um, so one way, there's different ways to measure it. One way is there's the inverse log Sobolev constant. There's other ways. It doesn't really matter much for what I'm going to say. Um, um, but sort of using this global control and the renormalized potential, we can get a bound on it that uh, is polynomial in uh, five dimensions, uh, something which we didn't know before. Um, and uh, so it complements results in two dimensions by Lubetsky and Sly. And of course, as usual, leaves open the hardest dimensions of three and four. Um, and, but for me personally, the uh, interesting aspect of this is that we actually, uh, this sort of uh, result uses in an essential way um, the Pochinsky equation, which is a continuous version of the renormalization group equation, one that sort of is usually said to be useless if you want to do anything rigorous on the easing model. But in this proof, it actually we don't control it directly. We use correlation inequalities. <laughs> so in some sense, it's a cheat, uh, if you like. But uh, um, it gives some indication that sort of these things which look perturbatively beyond reach, uh, uh, you can uh, get uh, uh, what, what we would hope for is actually true. In certain cases, we can, we can see it, but not in the generality we would like. Uh, anyway, I um, have four minutes left, but I think um, I, I want to uh, finish here, and uh, um, thank you. Yeah. Can you clarify in this last slide what is the log sample of uh, inequality? Or? Well, it's it's uh, it's basically a measure how how long it takes if you start um, your easing model with uh, some configuration, let's say close to equilibrium. How long? How, what's the time it takes to relax to the yeah, invariant measure? Conceptually, but then the, the, the inequality is, is what about? I mean, it, it it's, it's a, some generator of this. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it involves the, the generator of the Markov process. Um, so one way to, um, I mean, it's it's this, uh, one consequence of this is the spectral gap, and the spectral gap is just the gap in the spectrum of of the uh, of the generator of the dynamics. So this is a bit stronger than that, but doesn't matter for the purposes of what. One. And it's the gap of the dynamical uh, generator. Not. But you can do that on both sides? You can do low temperatures? No, we can. Uh, low temperature we'll hear about <laughs> tomorrow from uh, Fabio, but that's a whole, I mean, this is a very much a high temperature uh, game we're uh, doing here. Uh, a low temperature, there's, I mean, others can explain this much better, but the whole business of interface motion and so on is, 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 uh, is much more difficult. Uh, is there any use of these uh, relatively recent techniques, for, for example, of Cubinelli, the variation? Yeah, that's actually very, I, I think it's a very interesting development. So, so they, um, I've in fact, um, I'm thinking of mentioning some of, uh, I guess I sort of I have a uh, consequence here. So in some sense, the current techniques, they that are usually used to do renormalization group analysis, they're based on expansions. Uh, they don't, for example, use the beautiful structure of this equation. They basically butcher it in some way, or not quite, but uh, they don't use the beautiful structure of this equation. So these kind of recent methods by Barashkov, Gubinelli in particular, uh, they're able to use a stochastic analysis to get, uh, in some rather interesting way, behavior about large fields that would be much harder to uh, to see directly. Uh, so, for I mean, basically, this is a probabilistic uh, fact. If you, you go, oops. If you go to this this representation, you vary t continuously. Well, then this measure, this easing model, is a martingale, and that sort of plays a role in these these techniques. And it's not the kind of thing that. Um, uh, 
people have uh, paid much attention to in, in, in this probabilistic way before, but it seems to be useful. And uh, I think, yeah, so I mean, maybe that's roughly what I can say about it, but. Are there further questions? Mike. Yeah. But in, in relation to Daniel's question about the critical, critical exponents like beta below the upper critical dimension. So some results were obtained, in particular, uh, it was shown that uh, critical, some critical exponents, beta included, are bounded by the mean field values. And when you get closer to the analysis, there is room for improvement there, in principle. So, so it, this may not be hopeless. Thanks, Roland. Thank you.